of the air defense structure per se. We weren't part of NORAD. And so everything that we did was frankly on our own. We didn't have any official orders from anybody to get up in the air. This was just what we knew we needed to do as airmen as part of uh, the National Guard, uh, a response to uh, protect lives and property. And so uh, as soon as we realized what was happening, as soon as we knew we were under attack, the entire wing, the entire base, the entire capital region, as you know, swung into action to, to do something. Our part of that, I thought, was to get into the air as soon as possible. In case there were other airplanes coming our way, we didn't know at the time whether there was one wave or two waves or three waves even. If there were ground attacks, uh, it was just a chaotic and unbelievably complex situation and, and getting into the air was uh, what we thought the most appropriate thing to do as soon as possible. We on the ground, again, I was in the D.C. area near the White House, ended up at the Pentagon, were reassured in a sense hearing our jets overhead. But you were in an unusual situation, uh, General, because your jet was not armed. Share with us, I've read your accounts, what were you prepared to do had you been sent to intercept a hijacked airliner? So uh, the airplanes flying over the Pentagon, the first ones that you heard, the, the, uh, the very first one was Billy Hutchison, who took off before me, low on gas. He had just landed from a training mission. He got as far up the river as he could before he had to turn around and come back. Then uh, Lucky Penny and I took off right after that. Uh, we also, like he, did not have ammunition or missiles, which is our primary method of engaging in air-to-air -air combat. So. Not only was it an, a tremendously challenging ethical dilemma that we were facing, uh, but the reality of trying to stop something like that from a, a big airliner from hitting the target was something that we really wrestled with. And, and the only thing that I could come up with, and, uh, and the, my wingman and I discussed it as we were running toward the airplanes, was basically to, to hit it in some fashion, to disable it so that it wouldn't hit its intended target meaning a kamikaze mission in a sense. So, you know, I, I didn't want to go that far in the thinking process, but essentially it could have been that. I was hoping that I might be able to hit part of the airplane and, and pull the ejection handle at the same time uh, and, and uh, save my own life. But in the end, the, the part of the, the ethical dilemma is, you know, the needs of the one versus the needs of the many. And, and that's what we wrestled with uh, for many days after that because even when you do have a set of rules of engagement it's still a very difficult challenge the process general thank you for sharing that with us 20 years later i mean for a lot of us it seems like a very long time ago and yet it's hard to believe it's been 20 years I, same with you it's unbelievable how, how time has passed it's really hard to to think of that complicated challenging horrible day without really looking at what's happened over the past 20 years. Our government's changed, uh, our military structure has changed, the National Guard has changed, we're an operational reserve. We weren't that before, we were strategic reserve. Uh, we're probably the best trained, equipped, led, organized force we've ever been. And the people that are joining our ranks, a lot of them after 9-11 don't have that experience. They are joining knowing exactly what the threats are and uh, I couldn't be prouder of the next generation that's coming up behind us. General, thank you very much for being with us and sharing that story with us thank and you, our Bob. viewers this morning. Really thank appreciate you. it.